Well, good morning. Everybody doing well? That's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. We are glad you guys are here this morning. Thanks for coming uh, to worship with us. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them to, uh, turn them to Hebrews chapter 8. We're continuing our series as we walk through the book of Hebrews. And we've been doing this in, um, if, you're, if you're visiting for the first time, uh, we've been walking through Hebrews sort of um, on Sunday mornings as well as in, in our small groups and in our Bible study on Wednesday night. Just sort of uh, unpacking it, sort of I'm, I'm, I'm teaching some up here and then small groups are talking through some and Bible studies doing some. We're just kind of going back and forth, the idea being we're going to try to cover uh, the whole book together. So in those, we're, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 8, and uh, turn to page. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a hardback black one somewhere around you. In those, we're going to be on page 1065. And so what we've, what we've seen up to this point is, is that the, the author has, uh, if you remember, the author has been very concerned, the letter that he's writing is very concerned with, with he's writing to Christians and he's concerned with them going back to the old law, going back from they profess their faith in Christ, they're they, they following him, he, he, he is the way to right relationship with God, and then, uh, but now there's, he, there's this concern on the author's part that they are, they're, they're, because of cultural pressure and persecution and all these different things that are happening, they're beginning to, they, they would turn and go back to the old covenant, back to the, the, the old law. And so what we see throughout the book of Hebrews, we've seen it a lot and we're going to continue to see it, is this... Uh, this idea that he, he, he's building this argument, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and one thing after another, he's building this argument that, that Christ is superior. So you're going to see the word better a lot in Hebrews, and we talked about this in Bible study. Um, and so every time, uh, just make note of it, you're going to see that it, Christ is, he, 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 he is the, the better high priest. There's a new covenant. Um, I believe in, in a lot of Bibles, if you look at those, what we're looking at today is it's, it's the superior covenant. So there's this idea that it's not, that, that what Christ is offering is, it, it's better than what was, it's a fulfillment. It's better than, better than the old, old law. And we're going to continue to see that play out today. And um, sort of what we're going to be talking about today is this notion of, of the covenant. So we're going to talk about the old covenant from the old, the old law versus the, the new covenant. And the best way that I could come up with to sort of, uh, to sort of I don't know, illustrate this or put a picture to it is if you're in Bible study, you heard this. Uh, sorry, I couldn't come up with a better one. I just thought this was good. So you're going to hear it again. Um, so uh, it's beautiful. Like I believe what the first official day of fall was this week, right? Yeah, some folks are excited, pumpkin spice, everything, let's do it. And then, uh, and then some of y'all are like, summer's gone, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's a time to mourn. Um, but, uh, so one of the things that happens, and, and it has already begun in, 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 at, at my house, we live on about two acres, and we've got like 140 trees on our, on our, on our property, um, is the leaves are turning, and everybody will drive around and look and say, oh, look at the foliage, it's so beautiful. No, it's not, it's horrible. All right, the leaves have already, have already started to fall in my yard. And it is a war every year with me try, trying to get all of the leaves off my property and, and mulch them or do, do, do whatever I have to do to get rid of them. And so when we move to this property, one of the things, so I, I, one of the things that, that, that I, I uh, one of the things that I have in my shop is, is I have, like many, many grown men with houses, uh, I have a rake. Okay, and my rake works. It does the job. It takes a minute, if I'm going to be honest. Um, but in my on my property, I discovered very quickly that a rake wasn't going to get the job done. So uh, I uh, I have in my possession now a uh, a very large backpack blower. Now I in my mind I thought when 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 as I was. And we moved to the property and I and had the rake and I was like, okay, I'll do some stuff. I'll try to mulch it with the, you know, I'll try to mulch what I came with my mower and things. But um, I got to tell you guys, I thought that the rake would get the job done. I thought it would be good. Um, backpack, the, the backpack blower, next level. You're right. It is better. I mean, I could blow all of you guys to the back row with it. It's amazing. <laughs> Okay, and that it, it is there, there's no comparison. Yeah, a rake, a rake, yeah, it's fine. The blower, so much better. Okay, and that's what we're gonna see. We're gonna see this comparison over and over through Hebrews, and we're gonna see it again today. That the, the, the law, the law served a purpose, it did a thing, but the new covenant is better. It is far superior to the old law. So we're gonna jump into this. We're gonna start in Hebrews uh, chapter eight, we're going to start in verse seven. And what we've seen up to this point, the last couple of chapters is this idea that Jesus is, is a superior high 
priest, that he's of an order of, of, of a priest called Melchizedek. And I know we got some questions about that because it can be super confusing. The bottom line is that what, what is being communicated by that is that Christ is of a line of priests outside of the Levitical priesthood. He is something altogether different and his priesthood, because the the Levitical priests died because they were men. They, they lived for a while. They died. Christ, he's of a priesthood that doesn't die. That's the big idea. So he is superior, able to offer something better for us. And now he's going to move from that idea into this notion about the covenant. So you guys look at verse 7 with me. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second one. But finding fault with his people, he says, see, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. I showed no concern for them, says the Lord, because they did not continue in my covenant. So, this word covenant and law, these things kind of go back and forth. The first covenant it was, was the covenant that God made, in, specifically in this passage, what he's talking about is the covenant that God made with Israel through Moses. Okay, so what we're talking about is the mosaic, the churchy word for it, for it is the, the, the mosaic covenant. And it, it was a conditional covenant. There are other covenants in scripture, like God made with Abraham, and he said, I will bless you. You will be the father of many nations. This is what I'm gonna do for you. It is my promise to you. The mosaic covenant was a little bit different. It was conditional. Um, and it either brought God's direct blessing for obedience. If you do what I'm asking you to do, I will bless you, or... God's direct cursing. If you don't do what I'm asking you to do, you're going to be cursed. So that's the way this covenant worked. And so what that was, it was the Ten Commandments, right? God gives, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments up on Mount Sinai, and then the rest of the law, which contained over 600 commands. And roughly 300 of them were positive, and 300 of them were negative, okay? So the big idea, the, bi the, big idea of, of, of the whole thing was, if you follow me, I will bless you, and if you don't, I will curse you. That's the idea. You do good, you get good, you do bad, look out. That was the old covenant. And it, it was a contract involving two parties. And as long as Israel kept their end of the deal, as long as they lived up to their end of the deal, things were gonna go great for them. And we see that in scripture. When they're following God, they're blessed, their nation's expanded, they multiply all of those things. But when they don't, if they didn't follow it, things were going to go south, and we see that as well. They wind up in slavery. All these different things happen. They get conquered by nation after nation. So as long as you do what I'm asking you to do, as long as you follow my law, I'm going to bless you, and if you don't, I'm going to curse you. And what we, when, when we, the, the idea of the, when we break the law, what we call that, what, what, what that's called, when you don't do what I'm asking you to do, it, it's, it's sin. And, and so when we break the law, when they broke the law, they, 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 they would call that sin. So the second part of this covenant, the Mosaic covenant, was the sacrificial system. And this is where the priests that we've been talking about came in, okay? The, 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 the Levitical priesthood, they would offer sacrifices to cover sins. If you made a mistake, if you sinned, if you broke the covenant, if you broke the law, you, 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 you could get forgiveness. They would offer sacrifices. They would sacrifice an animal on, on the altar. That's what the priest did for you. And then so, and, and that, that sacrifice would, would, would cover your sins, but it wasn't a permanent solution because uh, it was a stopgap. The sacrificial system, it only covered sins temporarily. It wasn't a permanent fix. And so they needed to be offered over and over and over again. And that's the way the law worked. And in my mind, I read that and I think to myself, of course they sinned. It was an impossible standard right? I mean, how on earth are we supposed to do these things over and over? How am I supposed to never covet? Sometimes I like my, my neighbor's lawnmower and I think it should be mine or, or, or whatever. You know what I'm saying? How, how, how are we supposed to not? Like, how do we not do that? Well, and this is why where, where he says, uh, but finding fault with his people, the, the notion of the old covenant, the old covenant fell short, okay? It fell short of what was needed because we fell short, Amen. right? It is not, sometimes I, I, we couldn't keep up our end of the deal. At the end of verse nine, he says, he says, I showed no concern for them because they didn't continue in my covenant. So even knowing the rules, even knowing what was required, they had a list, even knowing it, they still broke it. Anybody been there? I've been there, I do that, 
right? Even knowing what, 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 what the law was asking, we still break it. And so why would anyone choose to go back to the law, right? If we know, if we have this new covenant available to us, why would we choose to go back to the law if even knowing that we know the law, we know that we're gonna break the law? Is that knowing? That's not in my notes, that, that was free. I'm just, I got off on my own on that one. But, here, but why would we do that? Why would we choose to go back knowing that we're, gonna, that, we're, that we're gonna make a mistake, we're going to break the law? Well, I think it's because even while we can't keep up our end of the deal, we sure like to think we can. We like to try because we're independent. We like to do it. We like to stand on our own two feet. Uh, and, and I don't, I, th- I think this plays out. If, uh, it is amazing as a parent, uh, once, one, parents, you'll know what I'm talking about. Once you have children, it is amazing how God speaks to you as a parent through your relationship with your child. As you see these things play out and you're like, wait a minute, God, I see what you meant when you said this. Like, um, uh, I know all kids are different. We've got three of them and we have one who is uh, uh, wickedly independent. Anybody got an independent kid? right? Just likes to do all the things, right? I can do it. I can do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, let me help you. No, I got it. Let me help. No, I'm going to do it. Let me help you tie your shoes. No, I can do it. Let me help you get dressed. No, I can do it. That always works out by the way, right? But here, here, here's the reality. I think sometimes we like, like my, uh, this particular child, I will not name names, loves to do things for themselves and I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And so there's a point at which I just say, you know what? Okay, give it a shot. And I watch them. And whether it's like building, like when they were real little, whether it's building blocks and they're trying to build a little tower and it keeps falling over and I say, hey, let me help you. No, I can do it, I'm gonna do it. Or whether it's getting dressed and you're like, hey, let me help you. And they're like, no, I got it. And they come out with like their head through the sleeve and their arm out the neck and one side, you know. And, and you let them try, you let them try, you let them try and they get frustrated and they get frustrated and they get frustrated. And at some point, they turn around and they say, Dad, can you help? What if God gave us the law in order to show us that we couldn't do it on our own? What if, it, what, what if, what if the law, one of the roles of the law is, is, to point, is to push us to a point of desperation and frustration that we turn to him for help? I can't do it. I can't, I can't keep, I can't, how am I supposed to do this? Because I keep, I, maybe I get five of these 10 commandments wrong, but, or right, but then there's 605 other laws I keep, I'm going to mess up. What if the point of the law was to show us, you can't do it. Would you turn to me for help? Romans 7 says something to that, I think. In verse 7, it says, what should we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. But I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. And sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when, when the commandment came, sin sprang to life in me. Do you see that? We don't, we, don't, we don't know what it is to live in right relationship with God without the law, right? Without, without that measurement, without that measuring stick. But as soon as the measuring stick became reality for us, we looked at it and said, we can't do that. I can't do that. I want my, my, my neighbor's lawnmower, right? And I, I didn't know there was anything wrong with wanting his lawnmower until you told me there was. And now that I know there is, I still want it. So I know I'm messing up. You see? The old covenant, the law, did nothing but, it, well, it did several things, but the old covenant pointed out our sin, but it didn't fix the problem. If sacrifices offered according to the law truly bought forgiveness, then there wouldn't have been a need for Christ's sacrifice. He would have needed to come to die if the law fit the bill. If, if the role of the high priest who was offering those sacrifices, if it was permanent, if he could always offer high uh, sacrifices uh, for forgiveness of our sins on our behalf, then there wouldn't have been a need for a better high priest, which is why Christ came, to permanently stand as an offering for our sins, as our intermediary. You see, the law reveals our need for a better high priest and 
for a better, for a new covenant. Look at verse 10. The author goes on to talk about this covenant. For this covenant, uh, for, for this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is radical. Okay, this idea, this, this idea is absolutely radical because the, the, what it's saying is that the new covenant that's being, that's being established is internal. Okay, the old covenant, it, 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 was, it, it was external. It was written everywhere. It was written on stone tablets. Scripture talks about writing it on, on their hands, putting it on the doorposts of their homes, writing it on our foreheads, which would look weird if you guys decided to do that. But the idea was that everywhere you go, everywhere you look, the law is before you. You see it, you recognize it, and you allow it to bear its weight, right? That its weight would come down on you, pointing out, don't do that, that's sin. Make sure you don't do that. Get this right, do this. That was the idea. And the idea was do it or else. The law was an external force pointing out sin over and over and over again. And like I said, even knowing what it required, Israel and us still violate it. So we couldn't keep the law. We couldn't do it. And what this, the idea, the reason is because there was something wrong. Our hearts were broken. There was a sin issue internally. There was something going on inside. We were still broken despite our attempts to live right. It doesn't matter how many sacrifices it offered. It doesn't matter how many laws that, 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 that we keep, all these external things. It doesn't matter. Our, despite our attempts to live right, we're still broken in here. And the solution to the external law was internal change. So God came in and said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to write my laws on their heart and on their minds. And I want to, this is sort of a two-level thing here I want us to process through, okay? The idea when we see, when, in, in, anytime you hear the word the law or you hear the word old covenant, you immediately think Ten Commandments, all the, all the, all, all the things, keeping the laws, do, doing all these things, right? And, and that's true. That's what the law was. But there's a, there's a, if we can get this, this notion of him writing it on our minds and, and, and on our hearts will make more sense. Uh, or I think we'll la- it landed differently for me. How about this? It landed differently for me once I processed this. The law, the whole reason that God gave the law, yes, it was to point out our sin and show our need for him. But what the law says, what, what, the law, what God is communicating with the law, what it means is if you want right relationship with me, you need to do all of these things. Okay, if you want to have right relationship, this is the list of things that you can do. Okay, now we're going to talk about, we can't, we've been talking about, we can't do those things. But God's saying, this is what right relationship requires of us. Okay, so the law as a whole, it's a big picture. The law was the means to right relationship with God. Okay, that's what God was saying. You want right relationship with me? This is what it looks like. Okay, now we can't do that. But God is saying, as a whole, don't just think about the law as in rules. Think about the law in terms of the law is my path to right relationship with God, okay? And we're going to keep that in the forefront of your mind as I unpack this, okay? Some of you are like, what do you mean? There's rules? No, trust me. Just, just walk with me through this. Deuteronomy 36, right, says, we were here. God, the law is our means. This is what God says. You want to be right with me? This is what it requires, you can't do that. Deuteronomy 36 says, we have a heart problem. There's something broken here. It says this, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your descendants, and you will love him with all your heart and with all your souls, and you will live. Here's the thing. The law, does, the law is a picture of what a right relationship with God can look like. God, but it's not something that we can reach. It's not something that we can attain. We can't, we can't do it. So God says, I will change the state of your hearts. You want a path to right relationship? I will change it. I will give you a new starting point. I will uh, uh, rebirth, honestly, in the truest sense of the word. The old becomes new. 2 Corinthians says it like this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away and see the new has come. So the path to right relationship with God for us isn't built on following the rules. It's built on heart change. So here's what I'm saying. When he says, I will write it on your heart and on your minds, what he's saying is, I, this, this idea of 
it, it, it's not the rules. If the law is the means to right relationship, God says, I'm gonna change your heart. I'll put the law in here. I'll put the right relationship in here. Does that make sense? I will, I will shift your identity away and I will put the law, the means to right relationship in you. That's the new start. That's the new creation. It's, please don't read this and think he'll write the law on my heart and on my mind and then I'll be able to keep all the rules. That's not what this is saying. I will put the law on your hearts. I'll put the means to right relationship. I'll put right relationship in you. That's why the path to right relationship with God, it's not built on following the rules. It's built on heart change. And a changed heart results in a changed life. Those things happen, but they result in a changed life. But even saying that, as soon as a changed heart results in a changed life, but even saying that, I think some of us are tempted to think, but what if something happens and I screw it up? Or if you're like me, what about when something happens and I screw it up, right? What do we do with that? And guys, we're so, this is, we're so drawn to merit-based identity. We are so drawn to define ourselves and our Christianity by what we do. We, we're talking about how to be made right with God. God says, I'm going to do that. I will put the means, the law, I'll put the means to right relationship in your heart. The new covenant says you can't do this because there's a heart issue in you. You can't do it, so I'm gonna fix it. I'll fix the issue of sin. So when I, when, so I will fix your heart. Then you'll be right with me. Not because you keep all of these rules. It's like, Taylor and I have been married, I think, 18 years now. And um, we don't, live in the same house, we don't have kids, I don't take the trash out, uh, don't take her on dates, dates, don't tell her I love her, don't sit and listen to her when we're talking about something, we don't, uh, the, with, like, I don't do those things so that we're married. I'm married and I love her. So there's a whole list of things that, that play out. But that list doesn't make me married. Does that make sense? That's the same idea in our relationships with God. When God, when God comes in, when he changes our hearts, when that happens, the law, the things that we're called to do, they take on a different character. Our obedience, isn't, our obedience becomes an act of love as God's children, not an attempt to gain acceptance from him. I don't take the trash out and come in and say, baby, we're still married, right? But it's not the way that it works. Normally, it's like, are you going to take the trash out? Sorry, sweetie. That's usually the way it plays out. Actually, now at this point, if I'm being honest, it's, are you going to take the trash out? Yeah, sure. Jonah, ride, take the trash out. That's, which is a great place to be. I'm going to be honest with you. As a, as a dad, they're old enough now. That's awesome. Anyways, here's the thing. Sorry. I'm off track. Guys, our obedience comes out of an act of love because of what God has already done within us, not to gain its, our, God's acceptance, because we've already been accepted. The law's already been written. That means to right relationship is already there. So our hearts delight in the law of the Lord because we love God, because he's changed our hearts. Listen, following Christ, if you've been doing it for any period of time, it's hard, it's difficult. Denying yourself, taking difficult steps that go against our flesh, it's hard, but our hearts have been changed. So even when we're in that battle, even when we're in that struggle, there's joy to be found because the God that we're trying, doing our best to follow, loves us and we love him. Look at verse 11. And each person will not teach his fellow citizen and each his brother or sister saying, know the Lord because they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. By saying a new covenant, he has declared the first, we've declared that the first is obsolete and what is obsolete is growing old and about to pass away. So the old covenant, this is sort of a weird passage. 
um, or a weird set of verses here. The old covenant consisted of a mixed community, okay? God made, God, it was, uh, God made his covenant with Moses and with the nation of Israel, right? Even with Abraham, I will raise up a people for me. I will raise a nation up. So, so and it, it, it was a people group. And some of them, some of the Israelites, some of them, some of the Jews followed God. There were those that did that, right? We know that. We read about them in Scripture. But then some of them didn't. They were just part of the nation of Israel. And so this, what he's saying here is the ones who followed God, he's saying we're always exhorting their brothers and sisters, the ones that weren't. Listen, you're part of the nation of Israel. You need to be part. You need to come follow, come follow God. So some did and some didn't. But the new covenant isn't based, with, the idea here is the new covenant isn't based on a single nation. It's not for a specific group of people. But what it's based on is the condition of the heart of the individual. It's an individual thing, and it would extend to any and to all who put their faith and trust in Christ. Their hearts would be made new, that they would know God. That means if you're in here and you profess Christ, right, you, we don't need to turn to a brother or sister who's a Christian and said, you need to know God, you need to know him like I do. No, they know, they know God. That's what, he, that's what he's communicating here. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter, hear me say, what your background is. It doesn't matter what you've struggled with or what you've done in the past. The new covenant makes salvation possible for everyone. No one is disqualified from the kingdom because salvation is available to all. So from the moment that you first give your life to Christ, I don't care if you've been a believer for an hour or for whenever, for a for hundred years, which would be impressive if you're here, by the way. Um, from the moment that you first give your life to Christ, you know the Lord. Now, do we need to like be taught? Do we need to learn? Do we need to grow? A hundred percent. Like that's, that, that is part of, part of the process. But absolutely, but from the beginning, we know him. We have Forgiveness. Christ's sacrifice offers us forgiveness, and that puts us in that right relationship. That puts the law on our hearts and on our minds. And forgiveness results in right standing with God. Our sin is separated from us as far as the East is from the West. It guarantees that our sins will never be held against us. Verse 12, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. That is hard for us to process, right? He says, I will never remember them. I will, I'm not going to hold them against you down the road. I'm not going to bring it back up. I'm not going to beat you down with this thing that you did 10 years ago. That, 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 that's not, I, I, don't, I don't even remember. I've forgiven them. I, I, I don't even remember. It's like, I think sometimes we feel like God is just waiting. We, 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 we come to him and maybe it's a sin that we've, we've dealt with in the past. I don't know if you guys are like me. I've processed through things at night when I lay down to go to sleep. And uh, a lot of times when I'm laying there and, 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 and I'm just thinking after I've, I've prayed and, and I'm just, just thinking through things, there are things that I have done in the past that will come back to my mind out of nowhere sometimes. And in that moment, I'm like, you are a not good person. I don't, I don't you know what I'm saying? Right? These, and I'm like, how could you have ever done that? What on earth? You're a, you're a, well, where, where it goes honestly right now is like, you're a pastor and you did that years ago. Or you know what I'm saying? Like the, there's these attacks, this condemnation. That's not God. Amen. That's not how he works. He's forgotten. It's forgiven. It's like, it's like when our kids, I've used this illustration before, but it's, I think it's perfect for this. Our kid, when your kids are learning to walk, like when mine were learning to walk, you know, they've got the, the head the size of a basketball and a little bitty body. And so they're all off balance and teetering around, right? And so there's that time where they manage, they, they get up and they're standing on the coffee table, which if you're like we were with the first kid is like covered in bubble wrap, you know? <laughs> now, with, by, by the third one, it was like, man, just leave the knives out. It'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> when you got, if you've got one kid, when you have more, you'll get it. Um, but so no, they're standing there, their knees are wobbling and they're hanging on. And then there's that moment where they, they step away from the side and then something happens and their head tilts forward. And sometimes it seems like it's almost by accident, right? They're just trying not to face plant, right? That first step will come out and you're sitting on the couch watching TV and you see it 
and you go, oh my gosh, that was incredible. You call, you call grandma, hey, they, 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 they took their first step. And, you, and then when people come over, you're like, hey, watch this. My kid can walk, watch this. And then they're, you watch them and they're doing the, 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 the fall, you know. Here's the thing. After that first step, when they, what happens? Right? That, that, they fall. And when they fell, when they fall down, at no point, did I look at them and go, you are so stupid. I can't believe it. You are a failure. You, one step, are you serious? What are you, like a year old? Come on, no. No parent in their right mind would do that. That's ridiculous. And God doesn't do it to us either. When he calls us to walk, when we take a step out and we fall, God doesn't look down and go, you're a waste. He does just like I do with my kids. I pick them up, kiss whatever boo-boo they might have, and I set them back on their feet and say, give it a shot, do it again. God does the same thing with us. And you know what, as, as the kids have gotten older, I have never held their falling down against them. When Jonah does something, and I'm, I never look at him like, when you were a year old, you faced, this is the same thing. <laughs> no. No parent, would, God, no parent would do that. God doesn't do it either. Even, I don't put them on blast and remind them of how they struggled when they were a baby. God doesn't do, he doesn't do that to us either. When we fall short in our lives, God doesn't come crashing down on us. He doesn't hold up our sin against us as evidence for our poor performance as his children. The new covenant, in the new covenant, in Jesus Christ, it brings forgiveness. And when I say forgiveness, I mean total, past, present, future. It is total forgiveness. That means that God, guys, God holds no record of wrong against his children. So when we come to him, and we say, God, I messed up. I'm such a screw up, man. I'm, 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 just, I'm just awful. God looks down at us and says, what are you talking about? You're my child. I love you. I've made provision for that. Now let me help you up so you can start walking again. But when we step back into that role of, I can do it, I can tie my own shoes, I can make this thing happen. When we step back into that role, we go back to the law. We're holding it over ourselves and God is looking down and going, would you just let it go? I am right here, I don't even remember, what are you talking about? You just walk. He picks us up, he washes our wounds, and he sets us back on our feet. And that's what it means in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, when it says that it's God's kindness that's intended to lead you to repentance. We come to him. Yes, we've made mistakes. Yes, we need to confess those things. But God looks and said, I've made provision for that. Here, let me get you cleaned off. Let me dust you off. Let me get your jacket straight. Okay, go on. You can do it. You took a step. I'm proud. That's the call. That's the new covenant. As we close this morning, I want to do something. It's not a little different. It's kind of the same, but it's a little different. Um, if you didn't receive a communion cup when you came in, would you put your hand up? Someone will bring you one. It should just be a little cup like that. Uh, someone will bring you one. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray, and then um, we're going to sing, I think. Are we singing? Okay, good, we're singing, good. I thought so. We had a meeting, so I thought we were. Um, here's what I want you to do. Well, let me just ask you this first. Are you tired yet? I mean, are you tired of, of trying to do it on your own? Have you reached that point of frustration like my kids or like, like, like happens a lot of times? Just trying over and over again and you're like, oh, I'm just, I just can't do it. That's where you're at this morning. God might just be waiting for you to come to him and just finally hand it over. Be like, would you just come over here? 
I can take care of it. I know you're out there. I see what you're doing. I love you. But would you just come to me and let me take care of that? This morning for communion, I would encourage you, even though we're going to have a few minutes here for communion, I would encourage you not to take communion until you've dealt with that. Maybe that means just spending some time in prayer. Maybe it means coming down here and spending some time before God. Maybe just laying down, like kneeling before the altar with your hands out, just as an expression that says, God, listen, I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm just going to give it to you. Would you just take this from me? My relationship has already been made right. I know it's right. The law is written here. That right relationship is available. It's there. It's, been, it's, it's happened. Would you allow me to live in that? And once you've dealt with that, then receive communion this morning. And some of you, I mean, some of you are killing it on the outside. I mean, some of you, you're doing all the right things. Man, you, you are, you're doing Bible studies. You're here in church. You're talking to your friends. I mean, you are doing, your hands are up during worship. You're just letting, I mean, you are, you are doing all the right things, but you are basing your entire relationship with God on the rules that you're keeping. And the problem with that is the second that you stop keeping the rules, in your mind, the relationship will fall apart. And that's exhausting. That's a pathway that leads, it leads right to pride. I can do this, I got it. I could tie my own shoes. And pride leads us, according to Proverbs, right into destruction. Rule keeping isn't sufficient. That's the old covenant. And it doesn't, hear me say, it doesn't save. I don't care how many times you come to church in this space. Being in this space doesn't save you. Christ saves. You need to stop striving. You need to stop trying to earn God's approval. And you need to do one of two things. If you have given your life to Christ, and maybe you've just taken it back and started trying to say, God, I, I, yes, I accept the forgiveness that you gave. Now look at how good I'm doing. If, if, if that's where you're at, if that's the life that you're living, you need to confess that pride. You need to repent of it, and you need to rest in God's approval. Or the other Maybe you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe you've just been coming to church. Being a Christian means coming here and singing these songs and, 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 and tithing to the church and reading my Bible and doing Bible studies. Maybe, like that, maybe that's where you're at. And, and you, you've just never taken that step. You've never given your life. You never said, you know what? Yeah, these are things, but these things don't save. So how about I turn and you turn and you give your life to him. Allow him to write his law on your mind and on your heart and to make that relationship right and then all this stuff that you're doing it's great stuff but this stuff will take on a whole different meaning it won't be a way to reach his approval because you already have it you need to make that choice today to accept him for the first time and find the forgiveness that God offers in Christ through that new covenant that we've been talking about So I'm going to pray and then give you a few moments to, to receive communion. If, if you're one of these people that I just talked to, I would encourage you, don't receive communion. Wait. Get, make that right first. And then receive. As we remember, because the, the communion is, is, is a, it, it's a symbol of what Christ did. It's a symbol of his birth, or not his birth, it's a symbol uh, of his death, uh, his body that was broken and the blood that was poured out that paid the price, that, that, that gave us the forgiveness, that allowed that right relationship, that wrote the law on our minds and on our hearts. And then receive communion as you're ready. And we'll have people at the crosses and we'll, they are over there to pray, to talk with you. You can spend time down here if that's what you need to do. I would encourage it, as a matter of fact, because there's something about a physical response to something that the Holy Spirit's doing in us. It leaves a mark, helps carry weight. Then we're gonna sing and we'll be, have people at the crosses who will pray with you if that's what you'd like to do. Would you guys pray with me? Father God, we come before you, Lord. We thank you. Lord, we thank you for the old covenant. We thank you, Lord, that, 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 that we, we get a picture of your character. We get, we get a picture of what's required to be made right, to be in relationship with you, Father. Lord, that's, that's, 
That's wisdom and knowledge, and we thank you for that, Father. But, Lord, we also praise you for the new, God. Praise you for the new covenant that you made a way to bring us into right relationship, not through rules, not through regulations, but through sacrifice. And that we have your approval. We are your sons and your daughters through the death of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, would you help us to stop striving, those of us that are basing our relationship with you, basing our appro- your, your approval on, of us on the things that we do. Would you draw us closer to you? Would you pick us up, dust us off, and allow us to start walking forward again, not to make you happy, because you're already pleased, you're already in love, but because you love us and because we love you and we want to please you, Father, would we not confuse the two? God, I love you. We praise you and thank you for this time. And it's in the name of your son, amen. You guys receive communion as you're ready.